Hi everybody, Mark here from PondAlgaeSolutions.com and in this video I want to talk a little bit about ultrasonic algae control. Uh, this is an update, a 2012 update for the use of the technology in ponds uh, because we've learned some things and developed some new programs which I wanted to tell you about based on what six, six or seven years now of uh, real in-pond applications and so I wanted to share some things with you today in this video. Just as a review, ultrasound for ponds, uh, ultrasound uses uh, sound vibrations which travel through the water and these are uh, very tuned uh, to a frequency that matches the resonance or cell vibration of certain algae types, many algae types. And these vibrations will start to create uh, vibrations and agitation uh, in the algae cells and ultimately they will damage uh, the cell membrane or damage some part of the algae which will ultimately kill it or disable it and it will die in time. Success has been achieved on all of the types of algae that you may visually see. Uh, that would include green water, string algae, um, hair type algae, uh, films, things like that. However, 100% control in every algae type is simply not possible and you need to understand that. What we're talking about is very specific species, certain ones that have a cell structure that is just very strong or they're mobile or motile and they can move in and out of the, the ultrasound stream um, and so they just have a way to circumvent what we're trying to do with the device. Now these are not the most common algaes fortunately and overall we find probably a 70% or more success rate with the technology in ponds, but you just need to know that it's not always going to be 100%. However, despite the, uh, the, the lack of 100% control in every case, these still represent very good options for large ponds, mainly because the cost of managing a large body of water with either chemicals or bacteria to try to reduce algae growth can be very cost prohibitive, and so ultrasound offers a very good option for them. For small ponds, we don't use them as much, and uh, by definition, I would say that anything, a pond up to about 75 feet wide or greater, or 75 feet long or greater, we would probably consider ultrasound in it, but most small koi ponds and fish ponds we don't we don't recommend it anymore. It has been used successfully, but it's just uh, somewhat cost prohibitive, I think, for some of these folks. So large ponds is kind of where we focus with it now and in industrial applications. So here's the most important thing that you need to remember about ultrasound. Again, if it's not going to work in every case, how can you determine the effectiveness of the system? Well, several options exist for determining this. And over the years, we've, we've evolved with these things to try to help improve the, um, the likelihood that it will work for a particular setting. We've done algae sampling and microscopic evaluation to see what specific algae is present in a pond or body of water, and that can help more than anything. It can rule out or disqualify certain ponds. If we find one of the few algae that it can't control, then that's an indi indication that we just don't want to uh, try to use it. Uh, you may find visual confirmation of the algae characteristics to determine whether it's viable or not. One example would be if you see a green water algae that gets very dense and dark and green during the day, but at night it, and early, early morning before the sun rises, it's kind of clear. That's showing that the algae is rising and falling throughout the, the day and night cycle. That type of algae usually has a good rate of control with ultrasound. So that's one indication. But ultimately out of all the things that we have tried, a in-pond trial or test of the system uh, in the actual environment and setting is the one thing that has provided 100% accuracy. And so we've instituted this in-field test trial rental program, you might say, and you can contact us about that if you're interested. It, it's a, a very uh, affordable way compared to purchasing a new unit. You can try one and see how it works. So here's a few tips for the best results with these devices. And again, these have come back uh, as best practices for us over six years of use and testing. And of course, it should all start with the algae type that you've got, as well as the size of the pond. We look at the overall length of a pond in feet. Uh, sometimes depth is a factor too, but we look at length in order to uh, determine the range needed 
We also look at the algae type to determine how much power we'll need. Uh, usually green water algaes won't uh, take quite as much uh, power as string algae would take if that's the common problem. So we use the algae type to determine not only the, the type of unit we're going to use, but also you know whether it's even a viable test or not. Once you get the system in place, the transducer is the can-like uh, component that goes in the water. It usually hangs down from a float attachment. And when this is suspended in the water, ideally you want to suspend it in at least three feet of water or more. If the transducer gets too close to a muddy bottom, some of the sound waves can get absorbed down there and it will cut down on the range. Now the biggest thing, the most important thing to remember, very simple to do but very, very critical, is you want to keep the face of the transducer clean and because the the head of the transducer will heat up a little bit it attracts mineral deposits algae could grow on it too in the early stages but mostly it's mineral deposits calcium if this face is not kept pretty clean and not every pond develops this but in in ponds with harder water or mineral content you can develop mineral deposits there and you want to clean that off or it will greatly cut down on the effectiveness of it so what we use is a uh, a vinegar and water solution will clean the mineral deposit off and then will polish the transducer face with a, a car compound like a I think it's Meguiar's that we use from Walmart it's just a polishing compound but it, the more you can polish this face up and keep it that way the less likely you're going to get this adhesion of these um, deposits so it helps uh, maintain the performance where heavy string algae is present first, we usually try to clear that out. We want a clean slate with this type of algae because of its dense masses. And so we use the ultrasound to retard new growth once that is present. And in oddly shaped ponds or ponds with a lot of obstructions, remember that you need a clear line of sight for the ultrasound waves to travel. They won't go around corners and they won't go through islands or solid objects, so you need to keep that in mind. And finally, remember too that ultrasound is really good in certain applications and it can clear up a pond amazingly well, but it's not a silver bullet. You may need to use the device and should probably use it with good aeration and some supplemental bacteria too because those are holistic tools that work in conjunction with the ultrasound. Ultrasound is only an algae controlled device. So uh, hopefully that information will help you determine first of all if ultrasound is even something you should be looking at for your pond and if you do have one in operation or you d you're thinking about getting one now you can at least keep the performance level up you can um, consider uh, taking some preliminary steps before making the initial purchase uh, in the first place and that's all good uh, particularly when it comes to managing your pond and your budget so we hope you find that useful if you have any other questions be sure to contact us at pondalgysolutions.com and we'll be there to help